All right, all right, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for being here today for our third installment of our Real Talk for Real Change Equity Symposia series on addressing inequities in school policies, policing, and discipline. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place that their nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing following both the federal and state government repeatedly, but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. The history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, the UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. I am truly excited for our event today, uh, after a week filled with great sessions and topics at the 2020 Diversity Forum and other virtual events across campus. Um, for those of you who, who missed the Diversity Forum 2020, uh, there will be videos of many of the sessions online available to the public. I am truly grateful for this opportunity to be here again in community with you all as we address the important topic of discipline policies, policies and practices in schools and how they negatively impact certain students in our school communities. My name is LeVar Charleston. I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Educational Leadership Policy Analysis, as well as an associate dean who directs our Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, or OEDI, as we call it, here in the School of Education at UW-Madison. OEDI and my colleagues in the School of Education's Office of Professional Learning and Community Education, also known as PLACE, came together several months ago to launch the Real Talk for Real Change Symposia series, where our goal is to identify areas of overlap between public problems and campus and community strengths. Collectively, PLACE and OEDI continues to call upon the expertise of faculty, staff, and community stakeholders to work with us in supporting and developing professional and community learning programs in education, the arts, and in health. This collaboration continues to be one of the highlights of my work here at UW-Madison in the School of Education. And I wanna take a moment to recognize and thank the Wisconsin Center for Education Products and Services known as YCEPS and the School of Education's Impact 2030 Initiative for sponsoring this event. Your support has made all of this possible and we are ever so grateful. Um, unfortunately, during these times, we're growing more and more accustomed to attempting to connect to folks virtually. Uh, this is not ideal. And while you know, I look forward to the day where we can shake hands, engage in small talk um, and build community, and even have some snacks. I, I miss the snacks. Uh, I am yet <laughs> encouraged that we can still somewhat connect even if it's only through the internet. Um, in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and countless others and the subsequent movement to defund the police, there's been increased scrutiny on the role of police in schools. At the same time, there's an increasingly growing body of work and research that demonstrates that Black, Latinx, and other students of color are more likely to be suspended, arrested, and disciplined in school. School discipline and policing continues to be an issue characterized by racial disparities that necessitate structural change. Additionally, the increasing call for school safety has resulted in a, a, in a punitive system disproportionately negatively impacting black and brown students, sometimes even without realizing the goal of these policies to make students of color and all students in general feel safe. The third installment of the Real Talk for Real Change Symposia series on addressing inequities in school policies, policing, and discipline practices seeks to engage campus, community, and national experts in exploring the complex issues surrounding the subject and to promote action toward creating more equitable and safe environments for students, staff, and faculty in schools. The Real Talk for Real Change series in general is indeed designed to focus on critical issues of racial justice in education and beyond by centering the voices of UW-Madison scholars and community members of color. Part of the significance of exchanging ideas and hearing from expert researchers, teachers, administrators, and practitioners is that we are able to facilitate conversations that will equip our UW-Madison and wider community with ways to support, connect, empower, and encourage each other toward more equitable and healthy outcomes. So our goal is that what is learned here leaves here. Right? We're not here just to exchange words. We're here to encourage action, accountability, and commitment. So at this time, I'd like to briefly introduce the coordinating committee who are awesome collaborating partners, uh, 
first, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lisa Barker. Uh, she is the Education Director for PLACE, uh, or Professional Learning Community Education, where she translates UW-Madison's educational research into professional and community learning opportunities. She received her PhD in curriculum and teacher education from Stanford University, was a teacher educator at Stanford, SUNY New Paltz, and Towson University, and began her career as an English reading and drama teacher at James Lake High School in San Jose, California. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rich Halverson. Dr. Halverson is the Associate Dean for Innovative, I'm sorry, for Innovation Outreach and Partnerships and Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis in the uh, UW School of Education. His research aims to bring the research methods and practices of learning sciences to the world of educational leadership and interactive media. Rich is the founder of the Comprehensive Assessment of Leadership for Learning Project and was co-founder and co-director of the Games Learning Society Research Center. He's a former high school teacher and administrator. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Urell Lashley, who will introduce our panelists for today and will also serve as co-facilitator for today's uh, symposium. Dr. Lashley is the Director of Arts in the Office of, of Professional Learning and Community Education at UW-Madison School of Education. Urell is de a developmental psychologist interested in self-efficacy and social emotional learning in arts, academic and integrated environments, as well as the founder and director of Drum Power, which teaches social emotional learning through music. The next voice you will hear is Dr. Lashley. Thank you very much, Dr. Charleston. Hello, everyone. So I'm very happy to be able to welcome and introduce our panelists as, as distinguished as they are. So I'll just get right to it. So Kevin Lawrence Henry Jr. is a professor in the UW-Madison Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis. Kevin earned a PhD in 2016 from UW-Madison and has returned to the, to the UW-Madison campus after serving as a faculty member of Educational Policy Studies and Practice at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Kevin was a founding member and policy fellow in the Educational Policy Center at Arizona, and his research and teaching focuses on racial capitalism and neoliberal restructuring, charter schools and, and, and school choice policy, urban education reform, leadership for equity and educational justice, and the politics of education. Henry's work is grounded in and shaped by culturally relevant and restorative justice approaches to education, critical race theory, as well as black studies. Ashley White is a professor here at UW-Madison Department of Rehabilita Reha Rehabilitation Psychology, excuse me, and Special Education. Ashley is the 2019-2020 Joseph P. Kennedy Public Policy Fellow with the United States House Committee on Education and Labor. She did her graduate work at the University of South Florida, where her scholarship and policy advocacy focused on ensuring equitable educational outcomes for students, individuals, and communities with disabilities, particularly those who are multiply marginalized by ethno-racial identities. Ashley's work, Ashley's current work examines how race and disability affects African-American student athletes at predominantly white institutions of higher education. Dakota Irby is a professor of Educational Policy Studies in the Urban Education Leadership Program at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dakota's work explores how school leadership can be used as a lever to improve Black children and youth's academic achievement and social emotional well-being across a range of K-12 educational settings. His research focuses on school violence reduction, improving school discipline policies and practices, and culturally responsive leadership. Dakota studied at Temple University and the College of Charleston. The purpose of his work is to cultivate within current and future school leaders the will, dispositions, and adaptive skills to lead educational organizations that honor the dignity of Black children and prepare the, the same students to live excellent lives. Corey Saffold is the Director of School, of school Safety and Security for the Verona Area School District, also known as VASD, in Verona, Wisconsin. Prior to his role with the VASD, Saffold served as a City of Madison police officer for a decade. During that time, he also served as a school resource officer where he successfully created and implemented restorative programs and reduced citations, arrests, and overall police involvement with the school. Saffold currently sits on the Board of Regents for the University of Wisconsin System and Office of School Safety 
Advisory Committee at the Wisconsin Department of Justice. And finally, Gloria Reyes has committed her career to public service and currently serves as president of the Madison Metropolitan School Board. She served as deputy mayor to public safety, civil rights, community services, public health, and the city attorney's office between 2014 and 2019, and was responsible for police development, management, community outreach, and advising the mayor on political and policy implications. Gloria served as a law enforcement officer for the City of Madison Police Department for 13 years. She worked as a neighborhood officer for the South Madison community, is a founder of Amigos in Azul, Friends in Blue, officers dedicated to dissolving cultural barriers and building trust between Madison police and Latinx community, and also served as a member of the Unconscious Bias Group, training law enforcement on cultural identity and bias. Gloria also led the diversity inclusion team in reviewing the Madison Police Department's diversity efforts and addressing real and perceived barriers in employment, development, and promotion opportunities. She's a longtime resident of Madison, a graduate of East High School and UW-Madison, where she received a bachelor's degree in behavioral science and law and criminal justice, as well as a master's in public administration. Now, Dr. Charleston will engage our panelists, and all of us in today's topics for discussion. I, I am super excited. I mean, after hearing those bios, I mean, I knew about it already, so it's not new to me, but I'm super excited uh, about this panel. And so I'm just going to move right into it. Um, Professor Irby, uh, you've done some extensive work and research on culturally responsive school leadership and, uh, and school improvement um, as it relates to, to violence prevention and discipline practices and and we're just curious, what are your thoughts on some of the primary challenges you see in disciplinary policies, practices, as well as policing in schools? And in your uh, work and experiences, what will it take to bring these practices to the point that there are equitable outcomes as it relates to our students of color? Thank you. Um, and before I, I jump into responding to the question, I want to first uh, thank you, um, faculty and staff at um, University of Wisconsin for inviting me to participate in this panel. In particular, thank you, Dr. Charleston and Dr. Halverson for reaching out. So um, uh, this is, as you mentioned, something that I've been studying uh, since I was a doctoral student. When I first started, um, you know, I wrote a dissertation about discipline policies um, and was an evaluator as a graduate student on a Safe Schools and Healthy Students Initiative. So I've had the um, opportunity to see um, the evolution of discipline policies and practices over time. And one of the things that has been um, a constant that I have noticed is uh, that there's two things that I want to highlight. Um, two things that I've noticed um, across time, you know, almost 20, about 20 years now, um, that are important considerations. Um, so you mentioned and already shared some of the statistics about um, the disproportional punishment and representation of um, Black and Brown um, students, youth, and children in. Um, it's being subjected to policing and discipline policies and so on and so forth. But one of the things that is important that I've um, noticed over time is that across time, there continues to be an overemphasis on what I call spectacular forms of violence. And on one hand, an underemphasis on mundane forms of violence on the other hand. And so I wanna break out, break down a little bit um, what I mean by those things. And again, I'll mention them um, spectacular forms of violence or vivid violence. And then the other is mundane or everyday cultural and symbolic forms of violence. And so this is important because most of the policies, most of the practices that we see are designed and intended to address and overemphasize spectacular forms of violence and minimize spectacular forms of violence. So these are things that um, are, you know, physical um, altercations. Um, these are, you know, loud kind of broad disrespect towards authority figures and those sorts of things. And so we see systems designed to focus on fighting those sorts of things as opposed to um, discipline policies that are designed to emphasize and focus on challenging mundane forms of violence, which are disproportionately um, experienced by Black and brown students. And so I want to mention this because 
one of the things that's important that we consider is that black and brown bodies in particular are highly visible in our society. However, the experiences that black and brown people have in a white supremacist and a racist society are mundane. They're typically invisible. And so when we see these spectacular instances, such as uh, the, the many uh, police shootings and videos, and when students take videos of things that uh, school resource officers um, are doing in schools, those become uh, projected as things that are um, spectacular. But the harm, the, the, the slow harm of the day-to-day -day experiences of racism in schools are just as important to understanding uh, how we can achieve safety and also how we can cultivate environments that allow students to cultivate and develop self-discipline. And so what I want to uh, under, underscore here is that there's an emphasis on um, if we placed as much emphasis on fighting the harms of racism and if we focused on um, challenging white supremacy, if we placed as much emphasis there as we did on the spectacular forms of physical and verbal violence, then schools would look very different because we'd be thinking about discipline and, uh, and we'd be thinking about these policies and practices as intended to root out and undo mundane forms of violence, which are really at the root of the spectacular forms of violence that we actually see. So that's one thing uh, that's important, this distinction between an overemphasis on spectacular forms of violence and an underemphasis on mundane forms of violence. And the second thing that I think is a challenge with discipline policies, practices, and policing is that um, educators often are not asked to really think as deeply and critically about questions and issues of discipline as they are about questions and issues related to the curriculum and to teaching. And these things are inextricably linked. They're not mutually exclusive. And teachers and educators need to have and spend a lot of opportunity in an integrated way thinking about questions like, what is discipline, all right? Um, how can it be cultivated? And so one of the things is that when we think about discipline, I don't think of discipline as necessarily a bad thing. Um, it becomes a problem when we discipline different populations and different students in different ways to achieve different kinds of ends for different students. And so the problem is not necessarily discipline. The problem is how do we actually get to the point where um, we, a person is a, a person or a group of people are disciplined and how that's actually cultivated. So as you mentioned, we know that um, black children and youth, um, in particular, um, black girls, uh, black boys, Latinx boys are disciplined differently than their white peers. However, their white peers are also disciplined, not in punitive ways typically, however, but they're disciplined too. Um, and we could talk about what that discipline looked like. So for one of the things that I example is that white girls are disciplined into a doc docility, into being docile and passive. Um, and so when white girls step out of that script, then uh, they, they, they're breaking the script of how their, um, their discipline is cultivated. Um, and so folks want to, for example, cultivate um, certain children to be docile and they're not, right? Um, and so we start to see these conflicts emerge because of how and why people are cultivating particular um, students to be disciplined in particular ways. And the challenge is, is that a lot of this is harmful to students' growth. And what I, what I like to think, ask educators to think about is that there's, in my research, I find these, there's primarily three ways to understand kind of like the discipline philosophy of a school. Um, and typically these different philosophies operate within the same space, within the same organization. I tend to take, take an organizational lens and these three different philosophies operate in an organization. Okay, and so I wanna name those really quickly. The first one is compliance. So a compliance orientation. The second one is a relational orientation. And the third is an interest orientation. And so I talk about these three things and I think about discipline systems and schools as having these three different orientations to discipline in one building, in one organization, and then competing with one another and then being applied to students differently depending on who those students are. And so we see that compliance um, is overwhelmingly applied to black and brown students. And this is really about um, establishing and maintaining order and control, uh, demanding obedience to authority, um, 
cultivating the kind of positive and negative reinforcements that are going to get students to do what um, authority figures want them to do. The second, relational. Um, a lot of educators focus on relational restorative justice and restorative approaches fall into relational. Social emotional approaches fall into relational. And this is really about building, nurturing, and maintaining relationships as the primary mechanism to cultivate discipline. And so if we think about some institutions, religious institutions, for example, their um, conception, their, their systems are set up such that the relationships are really the thing that cultivates discipline. So even if someone doesn't go to um, or hasn't been a member of a particular religious um, church or, you know, you're not, you have, you don't know the hymns, if you go into that building and everybody stands and begins to sing, the disciplinary mechanisms incur, help people understand that they should stand up and hum along even if they don't know the words. And that if things get out of, you know, if somebody speaks out of turn X, Y, Z, there's this moral authority and there's this norm within the community that actually regulates the behaviors of people in that community. And then the final one is interest orientation. This is really about cultivating and supporting learning and fostering a, a pre-existing innate internal locus of control through engaging people in activities to which the group is interested and that it affirms them and it helps and it is relevant to their lives. And so what I, how I like to think of um, these different approaches, again, um, compliance orientation, a relational orientation and an interest orientation is these different approaches get applied differently to different students. And so one of the um, things that is important to understand is that black and brown students are disproportionately likely to be subjected to compliance oriented um, discipline policies and procedures, compliance based policing, so on and so forth, whereas white folks are more likely to be engaged at a relational level and even at an interest based level. And so um, most organizations use and have a combination of these and they get applied differently. And so we can see different patterns of treatment depending upon which students get which kinds of dosages and applications of particular approaches. And so um, what I like to, to argue and what I think is important is that we begin to think about promising pathways towards equity is making sure students have uh, more access and more dosages of approaches that are situated within relational orientations and within interest-based orientations, which move us to the question of instruction, the question of intellect, the questions that assume people mind uh, can that their minds are the primary means of cultivating discipline is through engaging their minds and engaging their intellect. And so I see the most promising pathway uh, is the new and recent focus on um, instruction, on culturally relevant teaching, on all of these things that affirm and treat students who are the most vulnerable as people who can think, people who um, are intellectuals, and that through the mind and cultivating minds, we actually get to the end result of discipline in a way that doesn't require the um, kind of compliance and compulsion that we typically see. And so I'll stop there um, and um, thank you for allowing me to make these remarks. Thank you so much, Professor Irby. Uh, we're going to come back to you too. And, and, and just to let folks know that there is an ASL interpreter, if you like to spotlight that uh, uh, individual, you can click on that to spotlight the interpreter. I tend to, to speak very, very fast. So um, I, I will try to slow down. And also, as you all have questions, which I'm sure people do, I took a bunch of notes, uh, Dr. Irby. Um, write them down, put them in the chat, um, and we will give uh, folks an opportunity. We'll have a question and answer session after all the panelists have gone. Um, but it's interesting as you think about, as you talk about these three sort of ways to understand discipline, philosophy, and schools, uh, it, it, it sort of brings me to, uh, to, to Mr. Saffold. I, I used to call him Officer Saffold. Um, you know, you spent a decade, over a decade as a police officer, um, and several years as a school resource officer, um, and you effectively put into po place policies and practices uh, that tend to address the disparate outcomes that you've seen as it relates to discipline. And in fact, you're now in charge of an entire school district as it relates to safety and security. Um, throughout your past and current experiences, you know, what are the challenges that you see from, from sort of being a person on the ground to sort of being the lead to oversee a, a district as it relates to discipline policies 
And, and what are your thoughts on moving these policies toward equity? Thank you, Dr. Charleston. So, um, you know, when I was a school officer, so I have a couple of different, um, you know, challenges that I saw with all of these as a, as a school police officer. One of the challenges that really concerned me was uh, laws, laws that were created um, to um, bring out the disproportionality of um, black and brown students versus white students as related to drugs. So for, for example, the, the 1986 uh, Drug Abuse Act that, that was signed, it, it really made its way into the school and impacted uh, black and brown students um, um, in, a, in a much broader form than it did white students. And particularly that law is what determined how severe a penalty um, uh, anyone, uh, in this case, students got based on how drugs were packaged. One thing that we have to understand, and, and many of us may see this for now, but in high school, you have drugs. It's just, it's not something that we want, but it's there, right? And so, and it's there with everybody. It's not, it's just, in my experience, it's actually more, more white students. One of my biggest drug dealers in high school was a young white uh, freshman. Um, but what I learned is that the law stated that if you're drugs are packaged in individual packaging. Like, so the street terminology would be nickel bag, dime bag, dub, things like that, um, versus a larger quantity, um, like a Ziploc bag you know, filled with marijuana. In most cases, it was marijuana. The individual packages would get felonies, right? They would get felonies. They would charge more severe consequences because the thought was it's intent to deliver. But the, the other packaging will only be misdemeanors because of how it was packaged, but it was a lot more drugs. So again, it's the whole war on drugs era and how it made its way into the school, particularly with that 1986 um, crime bill. So what happened that I saw as a police officer um, coming into the school, and even before I was a police officer, when I was a security assistant and I saw the officer deal with this, I saw my black and brown students get arrested at a far higher rate and more severe penalty. I mean, felony was completely ruining these uh, students' lives. And so what I had to do um, uh, in a couple of different ways, and, the, and one of the beauties of being a police officer is that you do have discretion. Right, and um, one of the roles as a school officer is that you're an education, you know, resource officer. Is that my title was, and so uh, being an officer in a school, I had to make a conscious effort not to uh, contribute to that. And the way that I did that, and the way that I encouraged other officers to do that, was to use discretion in how we um, put forth the uh, this particular law, which you know, it's, it's important to note that for this particular um, law and other laws like it, 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 doesn't, it didn't matter whether an officer was in the school or not in the school because school officials called the police. And oftentimes they, uh, they will find something on a kid or you know, casual possession or intent to deliver, whichever one they thought it was. And then they would call the police and then it was left up to that officer's interpretation of what it was. And of course, um, officers kind of hinting toward what Dr. Irby was talking about they lean toward compliance and more um, punitive measures for black and brown students. So that meant felonies for these kids, felonies for, uh, for these students. And uh, from my experience, the ones who were actually dealing the drugs in large quantity were, were the, the white students and they just were not getting that severe of a, of a consequence. So what I did and what um, uh, my superiors asked me to do was to create sort of this criteria that officers would follow for when um, these type of offenses should be left up to the administration, left up to the school, and when police should be involved. And drugs was uh, was a big one. That just because a student had uh, you know bags of, of marijuana on them, that did not mean that they were there to sell drugs, and it definitely does not mean that they should be charged with a felony. The whole point um, on my philosophy of, of policing, especially policing in school, is that it starts with education, that those opportunities are opportunities for police officers to educate uh, students on the dangers. One of the main ways that I educated was like, hey, you know, this actually is a felony and it could ruin your life. And so that that was a big part in trying to get that across to other uh, school officers uh, as well. And just the department as a whole for officers coming to the school. Um, and so that's more of my role as a police officer, as a district director. One of the things that I that I saw, um, and that you know we're trying to still educate our staff and administration on, is this whole idea of being able to to manage or not being able to manage um, 
certain uh, students. And so in, in particular, uh, it, we, we, we find the students of color, they tend to have, or these students that have these IEPs and a lot of times the administration or staff just did not have answers for them. And what I learned um, in this role is that the, the school to prison pipeline or the, the best way to avoid it started in the classroom. That the more a student was out of the classroom for dif different uh, disciplinary measures or because of these discipline heavy policies, the closer they are to the criminal justice system. So on, on one hand, I, I remember very clearly my second day on the job as a director, I had a principal that called the police on a six-year-old, six-year-old elementary school. And one of my first tasks as a director was to educate that principal on why uh, that was not okay. And what I, what, what, what I found when I, you know, met with that principal and met with that situation with the police already there and trying to manage, you know, all of these situations that were in the moment is the inability to really um, manage and be able to engage this student, this baby, in a way um, that, you know, he was able to be successful in school, but instead, you had, this was an administrator who, who's no longer with our school district, let me add that by the way. But this administrator who just grew so frustrated uh, with her inability to, to do this properly that, 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 that the police were called. So I guess my point is, you know, for mentioning that, what we noticed is that there needs to be some sort of system or something created, um, this, this buffer, this idea of these resources that maybe a school psych person or um, maybe a school counselor, a team of people that could respond to classrooms when teachers um, uh, feel like they don't have um, enough resources or the help that they need to manage maybe a particular or two people in their classroom, someone that could respond and redirect that student and keep them in class, even if it means moving to a different class, but keep them in class. Because as I previously stated, you know, when they're, the more they are out of class for punitive reasons, the closer they are to the criminal justice system. But then you have a, a, a buffer that I like to call it of people that could respond and provide help and resources for both that student and that teacher in a way that's not punitive, in a way that just simply redirects and gets them focused back on their uh, education. So in this particular case with this particular principal, it was about really just, just educating, um, but then also providing resources like you can call me, you can call others. I mean, ultimately that person is no longer with us because sometimes, you know, People just don't get it. And then the damage that was already done with that student. So trying to manage um, in my current role, administrators and, and teachers in a way where, you know, here, how, how can we help you? How can we, we be of help to provide these resources for you so that you don't feel like you have to resort to these disciplinary uh, practices and measures? Thank you, uh, Mr. Saffold. You know, I've, I'm already seeing uh, some themes as it relates to this idea of educating students. To me, that's that's uh, akin to that relational and interest orientation that Professor Irby was talking about. That's research uh, and practice in action. Um, and as you sort of talk about sort of these, you know, these uh, the, the buffer idea resources or providing these resources, it makes me think about policy. And so, um, Professor White, um, great to see you. First of all, I'm so glad that you were able to join us uh, today. Uh, you know, I know that you spent some time in D.C. working at the government, uh, the federal government level on uh, public policy related to education and labor. And I know that your work engages school discipline and, and, and also you also come to this space as an, as an expert in special education. What are your thoughts on, on the main challenges you see in these policies and how we progress more toward equitable outcomes? Thank you, Dr. Charleston. Hello, everyone. I think there are three components that I want to address. The first is the disconnect between policy and practice. So my time as a Kennedy Fellow with the Committee on Education and Labor under Chairman Bobby Scott, it really helped me appreciate that there are people working in federal policy that truly possess a concern, a fervor, and a know-how for achieving equitable education for all students. However, the distance, for example, between where legislation is passed through committee to, for example, my classroom in Tampa, Florida, well, where it used to be, is a long way. And so, so disconnected that by the time laws, policies, regulations, guidance make their way to school districts and classrooms, 
they are interpreted and exercised in a way that reduces their strength for equity. Also thinking about lack of strategy, in terms of policy translation, I don't think that I've witnessed as much as might be needed in terms of ensuring continuity and implementation. While policymakers work to remediate some of these issues through legislative parameters, like reporting requirements, for example, from states to federal entities, I can't say that I have witnessed as much actionable intervention. And by actionable, I mean hands in SEAs and LEAs as opposed to just on the legislative document itself. When I think of lack of strategy, I also think about the preparation of our future educators. For so long, knowledge bases have operated in silos and knowledge has been disseminated in much the same way. Take for example, the ways in which pre-service programs educate various classifications of teachers, early childhood, elementary, special ed, et cetera. Every sector has its own way of preparing educators and with these differing methods, come variations in how socio-political matters are addressed, the extent to which culturally responsive and responsible education is addressed and embedded in curriculum and coursework, and more specifically, the emphasis placed on understanding disciplinary policies and practices for what they really are, which is sanctioned violence. The third component is context. Every policy and practice in our country has a target. I don't I don't think the inequities that we witness can be any more categorized as a structural accident. We cannot unintended consequence our way out of this. At some point, we have to acknowledge that at the very least structurally, policing of black and brown bodies is not an accident. There's a history and a context. And I wanna thank Mr. Saffold for bringing up this commentary around drug laws and zero tolerance. And take it back just a bit. In the 1950s, you've got zero tolerance, what I like to call post the original Jim Crow. You've got de jure segregation, it's waning. There's this new narrative, right? That white youth need protecting from the evils of drugs. In particular, urban and foreign drug pushers who are seeking to victimize and pollute the white upper middle class. This is further validated through a media inflamed panic where, for example, Mexican gangsters and drug pushers right alongside their black American counterparts are depicted as the root of the drug problem. So what do legislators decide to do? They implement zero tolerance drug laws and policies. Lopsided drug policies that continue during the Nixon presidency. Then you have, for example, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970. And as Mr. Saffold mentioned, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, which created minimum sentences for the sale of five grams of crack cocaine associated with Black American communities and the sale of 500 grams of powder cocaine associated with white communities. The Reagan administration continues with this kind of legislation. But what's important to note is that instead of funding programs that help support rehabilitation, this is a time period where the financial backing for the imprisonment of drug offenders is increasing like never before. Approximately $1.7 billion in funding is provided to states and federal governments for prison construction. Then you have President Clinton's administration, which resulted in, as a matter of fact, the largest increase in federal and state inmates in American history. So what happens? These policies are working. So it rolls over into zero tolerance policies in schools. Around 1989, by 1983, 1993, 1994, you have the Gun Free Schools Act. There's zero tolerance throughout our schools, except there's no definition. So you have this mixed interpretation of such policies at various levels of government. And then you move from zero tolerance to the preschool to prison pipeline. And I have to think of incarceration, not in the traditional way, but the fact that incarceration has occurred through suspensions, expulsions, high stakes testing, push outs, and basically the overall removal of students from mainstream educational environments. 
these zero tolerance practices, practices also contribute to a disconnect for students. They don't have a chance to have a positive or beneficial experience around schooling before they are impacted by a negative one. These practices, including this preschool to prison pipeline, it, it disrupts student experiences in much the same way that slavery, convict leasing, and incarceration, traditional incarceration has disrupted the cohesiveness of black and brown families and communities. So it's not new. It's just a new conduit to the maintenance of white supremacy, kind of a reinvention of necessary proportion. And the primary function of this bondage, whether it be through chattel slavery, convict leasing, zero tolerance practices, et cetera, is to reassert the power of authority of the ideologically majority white middle class. And I say this as a former special education teacher and as an advocate for special education services done right, right? There is not an equal, but there is a parallel history behind the invention of our special education system. And one part of the pathway towards equity must be exposing the history further of that system and intertwining the histories of race and disability in order to understand a bit more of the whole picture. If we examine issues of defunct policies and practices without examining the link between race, disability, and special ed, at the point in which we do move toward a solution, we are going to find ourselves repeating this conversation and repeating this work. Other promising pathways toward equity include a long-term commitment. And I say long-term commitment because we've had some very good ideas in policy and practice throughout the years. Has the commitment been there? I'm not sure. But thinking about more cohesion between policymakers and those who implement policy, there are not enough of those responsible for students, responsible for the policy. Restructuring pre-service educator programs so that there's a heightened communication between teacher educators, an alignment of ideology and purpose and heightened standards for teachers. And I'm not talking about the oppressive high stake standards that disenfranchise marginalized students and those who serve them but standards that allow for maximized agency for teachers who are getting it right. Engaging families who have been traumatized by their own educational experiences, and also remembering that discipline is meant to fortify and strengthen and prepare, not degrade and destroy. Finally, deeply embracing the historical intention that accompanies current policies and practices of policing, which would include a naming of issues in a way that describes their deepest level of impact. So yes, moving towards equity, but moving away from violence and abuse because at the rate in which students with disabilities who are also targeted because of their race and ethnicity bear the brunt of this violence or vice versa, we're not talking about accidents, but addressing a purposeful violation of civil rights. Wow, wow. Thank you, Dr. White. You know, it's it's interesting how all these are tying in together. Um, as I think and hear about you, you know, you talk about um, sort of the context was part of the three opponents, three components to addressing, and every policy and practice has a target. It makes me think of you know Professor Henry um, and and sort of the, this entire um, sort of this urban move to to criminalize black and brown bodies in the 80s and and it just so happened that I, i'm a glutton for punishment so after the diversity forum yesterday um as a wind down i watched 13th if you all have not seen it please see that because a lot of the things that um professor white was talking about um is made explicit in a very pictorial way um on that documentary um uh, by ava du i can pronounce, cannot pronounce her last name du duvernay um, but it makes me think about your work, uh, Professor Henry, um, as a scholar whose work deals with educational education leadership and urban education reform, um, to whom grounds and, and approaches this work from a critical race theory lens, you know, leaning heavily on restorative justice that goes back into sort of uh, what, what, uh, what uh, Professor Irby was talking about as well in his uh, other two, two spaces, um, you know, You've worked in places in the South, in the Midwest, in Arizona, Louisiana, Wisconsin. How have you seen these challenges take shape? And, and what do you see as, as our path toward equity in this space? Yeah. First off, I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Charleston and Dr. Halverson, 
for inviting me to this and all those that have joined today. Um, I'm going to do a little bit differently here. I'm going to share my screen for a moment. So hopefully you'll be able to see me as well as um, some of the images that I have um, constructed. And so I just want us to uh, take a moment as we are thinking about, as Dr. White has um, illustrated to us, the idea um, that we, and are you all able to see the screen? I don't know if it's sharing or not. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, but it's not, it's not in your presentation view, if you. Ah, if you okay, um, that's fine. Okay. Let's see what happens. Is this better? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, um, and I just wanna kind of echo some of the things that my colleagues have said, um, and particularly as we um, start this conversation, I wanna take a moment to think about um, Walter Wallace Jr., a uh, 27-year-old man who was recently murdered, um, who was a husband, a son, a brother, uh, a soon-to-be father who was living with uh, mental health realities and under the care of doctors. And so most recently, um, he was shot and murdered in um, Philadelphia. And so this intersection between race and disability is something that I think is central um, to this. And so when we think about what has happened um, with Walter Wallace, he's among a constellation of other Black people experiencing the totality of state-sanctioned violence. And they have most recently um, been murdered by cops and where the mantra, for instance, is to protect and serve. And that idea seems almost illusionary at best and beyond the scope of possibility at worst. And so I share this to acknowledge um, that the, their shortened lives, um, we have to honor them, but beyond the honoring them, we have to think about in this discussion about school policies and disciplines, their lives um, do not exceed this conversation. Our schools are nested within communities and cities and states and a nation, and yet, are a microcosm and, instant, and an instantiation of the large society in which they are located. And so unfortunately, that is a society that is structured by racial dominance that intersects with and is multiplied by other forms of oppression. And so, you know, we, we're familiar with the idea of the school to prison pipeline, um, but I want us to actually think a little bit differently about that pipeline. And as you see, um, you, you mentioned LeVar that I was in Arizona and in Maricopa County, which is inclusive of Phoenix area, right? We see that these disparities are so pronounced and profound and we see this along racial lines, but also in terms of ability lines. But what I want us to think about, um, and really Dr. White, I don't know if we, we didn't talk about this, but I want us to think about this idea of schools as an educational enclosure, right? So what we're seeing happening in schools is not by accident, right? These institutions are built in a very particular and unique way. And so when we're thinking about this idea of an enclosure, it's really informed by the scholarship of Damien Sojourner and Clyde Woods. And so Sojourner aptly coins this phrase of educational enclosures to capture um, how schools far too often become sites that concretize student of color suffering, as well as locations that crystallize anti-Black power arrangements. And so Sojourner goes on to note that these ideas of the educational enclosure embodies the removal, withdrawal, denial of services and programs that are key to the stability and long-term well-being of communities. And so the enclosure represents a barrier that limits the freedom of movement. Um, that can be a traditional barrier or social mechanisms that are seen and unseen, but certainly felt by communities. And so when I think about some of the main challenges that um, face us, I think I've broken them down into five areas. And these five areas are related to dehumanization, the reliance on punitive and carceral logics and practices, culturally irrelevant curriculum, pedagogy and leadership, a lack of organizational support and leadership, for doing what's anti-racist, doing anti-racist education, doing restorative practices, and then also a narrow focus or failure of imagination as it relates to what we want and desire in schools. And so what I see as promising pathways are related to two areas. One, this larger project of humanizing approaches, which I would suggest restorative justice as well as culturally relevant pedagogy falls within. This is what Dr. Irby has discussed in terms of his relational um, and interest orientations, right? And then a larger disinvestment from carceral logics and practices um, that often shape and animate schools. So I use this image here 
And it says the boy would be three times more likely to be placed in a gifted education program if he had a black teacher rather than a white teacher. What's behind the racial disparity in our education? And so I want us to think here about a larger emphasis on a project of dehumanization, which is a project that did not start merely in 2020, right, with the advent of, say, the Trump administration, but has a long history, right, um, that exists within the United States. And so there was in 2016, a study that was done by Yale professor um, Gillum, which essentially studied 135 preschool teachers. And what these preschool teachers were to do were to identify what they saw as perhaps problematic behaviors, right? But what was interesting about the study is that the study examined the eye movements of teachers, right? And of course the students that were in uh, the study were students of color, right? The, the images that they show was images of children of color as well as white students. But what they found was that the teachers looked more at the black students than the white students, and they looked more specifically at African-American boys. So this is important because part of what our conversation often is around is this idea of implicit bias as it shapes and animates schools and what actually happens within schools. But I think of Anthony Brown's work who suggests that for something to be implicit, it had to be explicit for a really, really long time. And so understanding that the implicit bias is undergirded by larger structural inequalities and large scale systems of oppression. So when we see that teachers implicitly might be moving towards students of color, it's not just a quirk, but this is something that is shaped by and it understood through a larger prism of the afterlives of slavery as well as inequality right, and settler colonialism. These things continue to haunt our schools and it is a past that is not past, right? As Christina Sharp mentioned. So the concern about black life and being um, that remains at odds with the idealized subject of schooling, who's often a white, able-bodied, wealthy individual, it's important to think about this as something that really is a friction that continues to exist with schools where some students are seen as disposable or other or abjected or seen as not necessary for the larger project. And what I mean here is if we think historically about education, particularly education for black people, we have to think about literally it being something illegal, right? Reading as something that was punishable by death, right? Learning as something that is in, in tension with a larger American project. And so learning would actually position black people in direct risk for legal and extra legal violence. And so I don't think we should be able, we should disconnect this longer history that shapes and animates schools um, and that ultimately becomes a larger uh, a psychological and structural problem in our schools. So the, this idea of dehumanization and seeing children of color as the other helps to explain why compliance, for instance, is often meted out disproportionately along lines of race and class, as well as ability, right? And so when we think about these larger carceral logics, I think it's really important to understand that these things are that which shape our schools. And often, unfortunately, there is a distinction that has to be made between, say, discipline and a distinction that needs to be made between punishment. And so the idea, as Kay Wen Yang discusses with punishment, it's often about coercion. It's about hurt. It's about punishing someone from a top-down location, right? And it's often ineffective, right? And these logics are often undergirded by a larger project of surveillance, extraction, um, and disciplining youth to be certain kinds of people. So it's no coincidence, for instance, that the modern prison, the modern school, and um, the modern um, psychological asylum, so to speak, develops around the same time historically, right? Those punitive and carceral logics become lodged, I would say, into the psyche of our um, structures as, as part of a practice of um, objectification as well as oppression. The other aspect of what we see happening um, that I would suggest is part of the problem is that we see this culturally irrelevant curriculum and pedagogy and leadership. And uh, Dr. Irby mentioned the, these ideas that this, these things are not disconnected, right? Discipline and curriculum and pedagogy are not somehow mutually exclusive. And so I've used three texts that are often uh, widely cited in education as it relates to culturally relevant teaching. And what we see is that they're often inverted, 
right? So as opposed to focusing on, as Latson Billings discusses in her work, academic achievement or sociopolitical awareness or cultural competence, what we have is something else, right? Which is a pedagogy of pathologization, which is about hyper surveillance, hyper labeling and hyper punishment. So these are the things that become at odds with I think the desires perhaps some may have to recreate schools to be spaces that are worthy of the children um, in which they're located. So what this does is create criminal students who do not fit within say normative standards, right? And what this also begins to look like is a, a concern around a lack of organization and support and focus. And so my work in Arizona had begun to explore restorative justice approaches and, and really districts trying to expand this on scale. And one of the things that we were finding, we, the people inside my mind, that I was finding was that there was a lack of organizational support for these initiatives. And what that then began to look like is that at, from a district level, for instance, there was no clear understanding of what we needed to be doing in schools to implement, say, restorative practices or restorative justice initiatives in schools. Beyond, say, a large scale buy-in from the top or at, from administration, we then began to see that uh, within a site, there were all types of understandings of restorative justice or, uh, that, diverted, that was differing and um, divergent. And so you didn't have a systematic effort to try to do this. But what's also important to note um, beyond this particular study is that there are communities that do have the things that we want. They do have restorative justice approaches. They do offer um, uh, a focus on restructuring pedagogy as opposed to situating it solely within the individual. And so, so it's not that it's impossible to do the work that we want to do in schools. The challenge, however, becomes that often we don't have, um, shall we say, the testicular fortitude and the ovarian outrightness to do what's really uh, meaningful for our children. And so, you know, when we think about another issue, it's this really what I would suggest is a, a lack of focus or a lack of imagination as it relates to what we can do and what should be done in our schools. So I want us to think about expanding the vision um, about uh, restoring our schools to be spaces that are humanizing, right? And when we think about this narrow focus or vision, we often say that we can't do this type of work. We don't necessarily have the resources. Uh, we live in a world that's super punitive. We need to prepare children to interact with policing. But ultimately, or we might say something to the extent that we need to reduce the discipline disparities. But by suggesting, for instance, that we're only reducing the discipline disparities among racial um, subgroups, what it doesn't do actually is challenge a larger logic um, that is situated along um, the carceral state or along imprisonment or along, law, along the lines of cops and schools. So we need to really think about what is it that we want to imagine? What is it that we desire? And so I think, for instance, of um, Sean Ginwright's work and he uses this um, notion of PTSE. And he says that it's persistent traumatic stress environments, which differs, for instance, from the idea of PTSD, which often situates the issue of um, issue within the child, right? And so what I want us to do is expand our idea around what does it take for us to challenge schools to be better, but by focusing not only on the child, which is usually what we do, but by focusing on the larger context and the structures um, that shape and animate education. And this is where I think restorative justice um, really becomes a central um, aspect of what we can be doing and what we might be considering to do um, for schools. And so restorative justice, and I really rely heavily on my Aisha Wynn's work on this, um, is really a process that is about addressing harm. It's about healing. It's about how do we create new relationships um, that are often predicated on care and on empathy. And it really focuses us not as like this is a single method, but rather an organizational shift that's required um, in schools to restructure them to be places that are safe and ultimately places that are worthy of our children. So I'll stop there and reserve um, the remainder, if I have any remaining time. Um, but I just thank you again for your time and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Henry. 
Um, you know, it's, it's interesting you talk about these, uh, these organizational shifts and, and sort of the trauma that happens in these, these spaces and, and thinking about sort of, you, you talked about imagination and these distinctions between discipline and punishment. And, and so, you know, our, our next guest, we are super excited to have uh, Mrs. Reyes, you know, um, you, we know that you're a school board president and, and you have regularly been engaged in these sorts of policy discussions and, and, and your experience as, as both an officer and detective and, and as a civil ser servant as deputy mayor uh, permits you, you know, a unique perspective. And so, um, you know, your work has sought to sort of eliminate, as I've followed you a little bit, these cultural ba barriers and to educate and innovate on equity challenges in our schools and community, that of which, you know, uh, Professor Henry and, and the other panelists have, have talked about, uh, most immediately Professor Henry. So we're excited to hear your thoughts on these challenges, um, uh, on how we should be moving, uh, uh, on these challenges and how we should be moving forward to ameliorate them. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, you know, my learning journey has been really messy. <laughs> um, and you guys all sound really sort of concrete. You, you, you got it down. Um, mine has been really messy. I, and, I, and I come from uh, the perspectives of many hats that I've played uh, in our community. And um, I guess what I would start with is, is having police officers in schools. Um, my, um, my thought is that um, the school to prison pipeline started before officers uh, came in, into our school system locally here. And, um, and that was because of a, an educational system that was structured in institutional racism, right? That is the foundation of our educational system. And, you know, much like what um, Corey Saffold talked about um, was really our administrators and our teachers uh, quick to calling the police for um, a disciplinary action. Uh, and then we evolved and we brought in officers in our schools. And my entire um, experience as a, wearing my law enforcement hat was really uh, about how um, it, it almost, um, having officers in schools at that time was having officers of color, right? Building that trust and relationship and having a policies and a practice developed on how we use our officers. Um, as we all know, as a community, as a society, we have relied on officers to respond to many of our complex challenges in our community. We are quick to call the police for everything. Uh, and there is no uh, substitution or uh, there is nothing in between, right? Something happens, we call the police. Um, and, you know, having that protection really, um, uh, for me, uh, allowed us to uh, be in a space where we can, um, uh, we can really prepare our education system, right, to deal with the disciplinary issues in our schools. Um, but, you know, uh, we... I found, I mean, over I, my thought just evolved based on what happened in, with George Floyd and what's happened across the country that we can no longer have officers in our schools. Um, we um, have uh, an institution, law enforcement, being a racist institution working under another racist in institution and felt that we just needed to take them out and we have to elevate and support our school community on how to prepare uh, for the behavior challenges in our schools um, quicker than what we thought we would. Um, and so, um, you know, we don't have the capacity within our schools um, to work with our most vulnerable students in a very holistic way um, and to work with discipline, right? Um, we, um, we are very, we have, um, organizations who, and public and private entities uh, working with the same families and students, but they're not working together, right? We are not supporting our students in a very holistic way. And it takes a lot of time uh, and resources to do these things well. Uh, relationships are at the center, right? It, it is at the heart of what works and building a community and relationships takes a lot of time. Um, and building a culture of belonging and restorative justice within our schools 
Uh, and that's what we're doing now. Uh, the MMSD um, school district, we have an ad hoc committee, a safety um, ad hoc committee, uh, working through what safety looks like in our schools now. And we are having these same conversations that we are having today uh, on this panel. Uh, we, it is uh, consisted of um, restorative justice practitioners, uh, community groups uh, who advocated for officers uh, to take officers out of our schools. Um, and we are um, really looking at our policies and procedures and our practices around safety and belonging and bringing a positive school culture and climate. Um, you know, approaches such as social emotional learning, you've, we've talked about already, uh, culturally responsive teaching, uh, positive behavior intervention systems, and restorative justice um, is, is what I felt is a practice, it's a practice, but it is uh, a culture that we have to infuse within our, our school community. Um, so it's just not a one set go program and we're done. It is changing a culture around restorative justice within our schools. Um, you know, research shows that um, systemic implementation of restorative justice at the school district, um, at the school and the district levels, uh, reform our discipline and reform our discipline policies can play a key role in addressing disproportionality and discipline outcomes. Um, we have the restorative justice, um, social emotional learning, all part of our behavior education plan right now. Um, but I think that we could, it doesn't have to lay within our uh, behavior education plan, that it is changing a culture within our school community. And as far as systemic implementation, we still have ways to go. I, I mean, we, we have an amazing school and district staff and community partners dedicated to this restorative justice work um, and we're moving forward, um, but we still have a ways to go. Um, we have to allow for alternatives for suspension whenever possible. And we've done that. Uh, we are, uh, we've included that in our behavior education plan, um, allowing um, the board adopted it in 2019, 2020 allowing schools to choose um, to offer alternatives for specific behaviors. Uh, and we've used that in all secondary schools. Uh, we need to keep expanding this and continue to support uh, uh, our school staff and teachers so that um, they have the training, the time and space to offer meaningful alternatives for our children. Um, and we need to increase our direct support for our teachers provide professional development, mentoring, ongoing training. Um, we, we, since we've taken officers out of our schools, it has really elevated uh, the conversation at the board level, uh, at the administration level. Our new superintendent is just amazing. If you haven't met him yet, um, uh, he's uh, brought in Dr. Ladson Billings to help us with this work in our training. Um, and so it is, um, it is a process, but at the end of the day, we made a really big move in taking our officers out of our schools. Uh, and at this time, obviously we're not in schools, but by the time we get back, uh, I strongly believe we'll be well prepared um, for the future. All right, thank you so much, Gloria. And thanks to everybody for, for such powerful information and thoughts on the challenges and pathways. Um, so we'll now look to the chat for some questions and address sort of the issues, that, some of the issues that folks have, but you, you all have really brought a wealth of powerful experience and thoughtful work for us to consider. So we definitely very much appreciate that. So there are a few questions that folks have that are specific, aimed at, at, at specific panelists, but I wanna encourage everyone to, to, to respond to them. Um, you know, as, as, as you feel the impulse. So we have one question from Melinda Forsberg to Dr. Irby uh, from, from earlier in the chat, basically asking, in your research pertaining to discipline philosophies, have you studied the intersectionality of, of disability or differ differently abled students of color? And how have students of color who have behavior disorders in terms of how, how they're differently, differentially disciplined compared to white students with behavior disorders. And I can see, I, was, I would like to ask Dr. Irby to respond to that first and then probably 
Dr. White too, because I imagine that is an easy cross. And then everyone else, please. So Dr. Irby, do you have any thoughts on that? My thoughts are not going to be as tight as Dr. White's. Um, <laughs> so uh, in my research, yeah, as, as folks on the panel have mentioned, there is a intersection between uh, race and identification of different abilities, um, both in terms of uh, different able in terms of um, both um, gifted education or for um, special identified for special learning needs um, and those sorts of things. So they're inextricably linked. However, I haven't and my research does not focus specifically on uh, students with special lear special learning needs. Um, but in general, uh, the patterns are that students are, you know, black and brown students are over identified um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, more so than their uh, their white peers. I mean, that's pretty much a consistent across the board. Um, I like to um, think about it, and uh, I, I'm I'm really into uh, like comedy. I love comedians. Um, Paul Mooney um, talks about how uh, for you know for white folks to base white folks have to do something like egregious. Um, and like black folks can to, to end up in jail to be punished. They have to do something to greet, like mur murder three people. And black people have to not pay their parking tickets. That's about the difference. Or if we're talking about schools, they just have to be on school grounds after hours um, and get tickets and those sorts of things. So just across the board, that's a that's a, just a basic general pattern um, uh, that um, and, and I'll turn it over to let uh, Dr. White speak more, uh, more specifically. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Irby. Great job. I, um, <laughs> I think, first of all, this notion of EBD, emotionally behavior disorder, that's, that is a term <clears throat> that we have to reckon with in terms of special education. And like we look at the history of all of these other components, race, race ethnicity, disability, there's a history behind EBD, right? And that connects very closely to this, this notion of what is culturally responsive for some and not others. Dr. Irby mentioned statistics. The recent CDC data just came out. So if you're interested in what it looks like, it looks pretty much like it looks all every time bad. But but the CDC data really gives you an indication of where those disparities lie. And again, to echo Dr. Irby's point, you're gonna have black and indigenous students are always competing for the bottom spot. And then you have Lat Latino students, Latina students, Latinx students also in the mix. And a lot of the issues around EBD for them come with language barriers. I say all that to say, we really need to look at the context. We need to look to culturally responsive practices to figure out how we can remediate these issues of disproportionality, particularly in learning disabilities and in the categories of EBD. And <clears throat> although I hesitate to say it, we really we have to think about who's teaching our children. Uh, everybody shouldn't be teaching our children. And and we have to think about who's in the classroom and ways to ensure that the teachers that we put in front of our children with their different histories and cultures and ways of knowing that they know how to deal with that, that they know how to embrace that and that they have alternative strategies to deal with what we might call challenging behavior. Great, thank you very much. So folks are, and I think Ms. Reyes spoke to this a bit, just in, in detailing sort of what MMSE is trying to do and setting out to do now that's been different than, than in the past in terms of curricular work and the behavior, behavior education plan. But one of the questions we have from the chat from, from Kim Irby, I, I imagine no relation, <laughs> is uh, they say, I think teachers and administrators need to have training before they enter schools, into our schools. The school's education, the school's education essentially needs redesign. So what might this sort of redesign look like? And I know, Dr. Henry, you got at some of these um, issues in specific too. So I guess we'll start, we'll start with you. 
and they maybe move to Mr. Saffold after that. Yeah. Uh, in my, yes. So I think that's a really wonderful question. Um, our schools of ed absolutely do need to be redesigned. And I would say, and I'm not just saying this because I work at Wisconsin, um, but if you look, for instance, at the ELPA department, part of what we're doing in our department is focusing on social justice oriented approaches, right? And so this is not necessarily a new phenomenon that takes place in some schools of education, um, but it's certainly one that's taking place at our, in our program. And so what we really need to be thinking about um, as it relates to the preparation of teachers and administrators, psychologists and counselors, is thinking about how do we equip um, educators with the knowledge and experience and um, dispositions to essentially be effective um, with our students. And that really is based upon actually addressing these large standing issues around racial inequality and white supremacy, as well, <laughs> excuse me, as well as ableism and a whole host of issues that often shape our schools that are pertaining to our students. And so we really have to be very concerted uh, about the, our efforts to engage in anti-racist teaching um, at the university level, but also making sure um, and this is not a question of merely gatekeeping, but making sure that we are admitting students who are committed to doing that type of work, right? Because the stakes are very high. Um, Dr. White mentioned this, not everyone should be teaching, right? Most of my work has focused on post-Katrina New Orleans. And one of the things that happened after Hurricane Katrina some 15 years ago was the erasure of veteran educators and the replacing of them with those that have been affiliated with alternative certification programs where they take about two months in the summer to prepare to enter into urban districts. And that doesn't work, right? And as the old saying goes, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. We don't see folks lining up in suburbs to try to get teachers who are ill-prepared to teach their children, right? And we should have the same types of requirements um, and, and in fact demand those types of um, robust education programs and certification programs for our students um, in urban districts. And so all that's to say that I think we really have to rethink the curriculum as well as the field experiences that we're offering um, our teachers. And that's work that has been done and people are trying to do that, but we have to expand that across the board, across our colleges of education. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. Um, Mr. Saffold, you have some thoughts on, on the idea of sort of what, what a redesign might look like from what you're seeing from the students that you're supporting? Yes, sir. So, so one of the things that we're doing beginning in January, we're hiring a person um, and a team of people to think all things uh, uh, equity and to really shift and change our entire uh, structure of school, um, curriculum, sports, um, disciplinary measures, um, uh, the geographical uh, breakdown of how uh, kids are enrolled, um, the families, the community, even how kids are bused in. And this person is uh, come in and just rethink the whole thing and look at everything from an equity lens and uh, look at the data and figure out um, even the areas that we may not see where there may be the, the disparities and examine all these areas and restructure everything. And so uh, one of the um, results of that um, is that we've our black staff have, have already organized and um, have gotten together. And one of the ideas that I did that I put forward is this, where I'm in, actually in the process of writing this memorandum of understanding with Howard University. Um, Dr. Irby mentioned it already too, because one of those areas, right, is how do we, do we have uh, enough black staff, staff that our kids can can relate to? I think it was um, maybe Dr. Dr. Henry that also mentioned the, the connection and what that really means for our, our uh, students of color, because studies show that not just white students, but also students, our black students re relate and they're challenged by um, staff of color. So even now at, at Howard, we're recruiting teachers to come into our district, we're calling it the, the Howard to Verona pipeline, where these staff, these students are gonna graduate, they're gonna come here and they're gonna teach because we're trying to approach everything, everything from an equity lens, the STEM program. And so, you know, beginning in January, when this team is more structured, we're gonna redo our entire district from that lens. And so that's kind of our approach to trying to address these issues um, um, and, and the curriculum. And one of the, the launch paths to that was actually a white student who graduated and he wrote, 
the school board and the administration was disappointed about the lack of knowledge that he received about uh, uh, African American um, uh, history, and from that lens, he just felt he said that he felt like he wasn't educated enough about um, you know black people and and um, everything in history wise that that has to relate to. And so we just happened to restructure, redo all of that. So something that exciting that we're going to be putting forth. All right, thank you. Uh, did anybody else want to weigh in on this particular question? All right, we'll keep it moving. So, and and I, I want to also just circle back quick, briefly to, to to something Dr. Henry said, which is super important. And you know, we we have one comment, and I'll get to in and explain exactly what the question is in a moment. But the comment is essentially about, um, you know, feeling frustrated about the treatment of young children, in particular, in relation to the story I think Mr. Sappho you shared about. Um, you know, a young child being removed and, and, and also just students not being engaged. And Mr. H Dr. Henry, you made the point that's really important, which is, you know, if we're in the community as parents, for example, we often are thinking about advocacy and we go to our schools and we ask for things or we go to the school board and we ask for things, but we don't often make the full connection back to pre-service teacher training, for example. and you know, what what teachers are taught, what skill sets they arrive at the schools with. So I think that's a, a super important point. And it actually leads quite nicely to thinking about um, advocacy on a broader level. And so this, this, one of the comments was essentially, what are some, was essentially expressing frustration at what happens to students, which led me to think, what are some ideas that you all might have around how to advocate against these disciplinary practices um, and at, at the different places where that might matter. And I guess I'll start with, with Dr. White on this one, if that's okay. Okay. I think just based on my experience, one of the best places to start is what teachers do in their classrooms. We often forget when we move away from classrooms, what that was like and how meaningful our choices are, even within the four walls of that small space with that 20 or 30 students. Someone mentioned earlier in the chat box that teachers are too inexperienced and low performing. And I think we have to look at what that means really define what low performing means or what high performing means or all, all of these terms that really are relative. I think about my first year in te or teaching school and when I see my kids back home that I taught my first year, I usually apologize to them because I was so bad at, at it, you know what I mean? And there was so much I didn't know and they'll say, oh, Miss White, that's fine, you know? And so, but, but over time I learned tools and strategies for getting at new ways to work with students who have quote unquote challenging behaviors, if that's what you're getting at, Dr. Lashley. I think of, oftentimes some of the school-wide and, and district-wide practices that we have are not infused with culturally responsive practices. Take, for example, PBIS, which works towards challenging behavior. Some of those need to be re-envisioned in a way that's more culturally inclusive. Florida PBIS is doing some significant work around that as well as the National PBIS Center. But I guess finally, I would say communicating with other teachers, right? Finding ways, finding teachers that are getting it right and are, and are doing things in their classroom that you want to emulate. That's a lot of how I learned how to be a better teacher is by watching those who were doing better than I was and who were making strides with children that other people said that it couldn't be done. I think communication is a big factor. All right, thank you. Yeah, I actually wasn't getting at <laughs> students would would who who we would say might struggle with behavior problems, but rather even even just you know low levels of engagement, as Mr. Sappho was talking about. Just like bottom line, how do you you know oh. preparation to be able to run a class and keep folks find some vitality from students, right? That and that that expresses in different ways. Can I add something? Sure. Thank you for that redirection. Mm -hmm. Deal with your students outside of the classroom. 
go to their football games, talk to their parents, go to the local stores that they frequent. When students are in your classroom, they need to know you as not just your teacher, as not just their teacher, but as someone that they know as a human being and see in their community. That's one of the best ways that I learned to engage with students. When you see them on the weekend and you talk to them, and I had a student once and I said to him, yo, listen, if you can do X, Y, and Z for me, I'm headed to your game on Saturday. I will watch every game you play on Saturday, but I need you to do this for me Monday through Friday. We kind of had this deal and it's things like that that make all the difference. It's things like that that highlight agency of teachers. And I think what um, Dr. Lawrence mentioned around humanistic environments of learning, those are some of the things we can think about when we, when we think about engagement. It doesn't always have to be up here. So think about what your students need in your classroom and how you can engage with them outside of the classroom. Thank you for adding that. Uh, would anyone like to uh, add a few comments to this? Or I mean, I, I guess I would just add. I mean, Dr. White. I mean, you just you just hit right on it. Um, I think having we there was a point in time where our Madison schools would um, we would have our our principals, our teachers out in our communities, right? And they would be out at um, our neighborhoods on the weekends, um, they had a relationship with uh, our families and we've lost that along the way. And it's just the most basic um, and easy thing to do to build that trust and relationship with our students and our families, right? Uh, our, our families um, don't always feel comfortable coming into the school. Uh, and uh, it means so much uh, when, you are, when you are seen um, at a football game or, you know, at the playground in our neighborhoods, um, that is um, so impactful. And, and MMSD used to do that. Um, uh, back in my day, um, we did have um, teachers, um, principals, uh, and staff out in our communities. We lost that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So I want to shift a little bit uh, we have some specific questions, Dr. White, somebody was asking, and very insightfully, so what are your thoughts on specialized classrooms uh, for differently abled students? Um, do they do more harm than good? And what suggestions do you have about policies regarding these structures? And then I'm adding to that and also the issue of labeling. <laughs> I am, oh, I'm going to read what I wrote in the chat box, which is basically that I am a proponent of inclusivity, but in the real and long-term sense. Sometimes the way we think about inclusive education these days is not real inclusion, uh, more along the lines of assimilation or forcing students into a box in which they don't fit instead of providing interventions and accessible spaces so that they can thrive in general classrooms. The thing is there are laws and policies currently on the books that could help to remediate these issues. But the problem again is implementation. It gets lost along the way and funding. And then I wrote fully, hashtag fully fund IDEA because full funding would allow for the realization of inclusive classrooms and environments. We're asking for things that in many places and spaces our budget just doesn't allow for. And Segregated classrooms are not always completely inappropriate, but that's a case by case basis. When you're talking about cognitive disabilities, congenital disabilities, learning disabilities, et cetera, for me, that's a no, because I've had all of those students in my, in my general ed classroom. But again, the linchpin is that, is, is that we cannot expect teachers to do this work without appropriate preparation. And that does include funding. As far as labeling is concerned, again, it has a very problematic history. Christine Sleater has some great articles on the history of learning disabilities, et cetera, and how that came about and how it was that learning disabilities became a target term for black and brown populations. I think as many people on the panel have reiterated, you have to look back to really understand what, what we're dealing with now. So yes, I do think labels in some sense are problematic and we have to look to the history for that. All right, thank you. 
Uh, would anyone else like to weigh in on that particular issue or any piece of it? All right, we'll keep it moving and see what else we got here. Um, do we do we feel like educators have lost connection? And maybe this is really apropos to the moment we're in dealing with the pandemic. But do we feel like educators have lost connection with the community because we are overworked and exhausted? But also as administrators, administrators have have tasks that sort of overwhelm their plates and their plates are overflowing. <clears throat> what might account for educators not being able to or not choosing to connect within the community in the ways that that you, Dr. White, have described and, and many others have described as really necessary. And I guess I'll, Dr. Irby, would you want to start us on that one? Yeah, I, I'll be happy to jump in. So I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Henry to jump in on this one with me too, because uh, some of the comments that I think are important to this are about, um, you know, capitalism. Um, neoliberalism, this uh, and, and policy, um, and so I think this issue of community. Uh, one of the things that I wrote down in my notes as folks were talking is, you know, um, how do you how are we conceptualizing the school, and what forces are, are at play that make us conceptualize the school in a specific kind of way where we have clear demarcations between what's professional and what's not, what's what's a weekend what's the work week when is the day over when it's not all of these things are consequences of capitalism right we have a weekend because of how capitalists want to organize our work right um so we have to think about it in those in that context um i don't necessarily only think it's something that is about administration or administrators administrators are subject to the same kind of like neoliberal forces and let me just for folks on the call who don't, I don't want to just use this academic term of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism and neoliberal is basically about assuming that things that we think of as collective and public uh, are best managed through private mechanisms and private means. And so we think about the idea of um, neoliberalist policies. It makes things that are public concerns, for example, teachers and administrators should share similar concerns about education and we individualize it and compartmentalize and fragment you know members of society so on and so forth so that we get down to this point where um private individual choice and decision making is what drives everything um so i would say that like that um it's a host of different kinds of pressures that trickle down to teachers and then teachers put pressure on students and parents and parents put pressure on students. And so um, this is a broader context and a broader cultural phenomena in which this is actually happening, even in terms of, and I wanna get back to even in terms of the way we conceptualize what the school and what school actually is. Um, so this is a, it's, I think it's, it, and I'm saying all this to say that I think there's more complexities to just we're overworked. I think, yes, folks are overworked, but the challenge is that the response to being overworked is not that this is the administrator's fault and they should give us less. It's more about what is reasonable, what do policymakers put on, um, and uh, what kind of demands the policymakers make on school leaders, on teachers, on educators, um, and those sorts of things. So I think there's a larger set of cultural um, and economic forces that are at play. One of them to be very concrete is uh, the, the, the rollback and retrenchment of uh, the funding that is required to actually allow people the time and space to be able to do their work. There's no real reason that teachers shouldn't have sabbaticals, for example, right? Um, so this gets back to um, Dr. Henry's idea of imagination. And um, if we have imagination, there's no reason why if we had a mass movement of people who were really um, concerned about making sure teachers and administrators have the resources, including time to be well and time to think and time to learn, there, that's a possibility that requires working towards something that we're not in right now, but moving towards something that we might imagine might be better for educators in general. 
And so I think that, um, and I mentioned that because I think there's larger forces that are played at pit us and pit teachers and administrators, for example, against one another. And I want to turn over to somebody else, uh, you know, brother, uh, Dr. Henry to, to maybe elaborate some as well. Yeah, right, we, we get, excuse me one second. We just have to have, if you could respond to it fairly quickly because we're coming to the end of the time, but I, I know yes. you can be succinct. I, I will try to be <laughs> as succinct as possible. Um, <laughs> You know, they say brevity is the soul of the wit. So we'll see what I can do. Um, so I just, a few things. One, I think Dr. Irby is, is spot on as it relates to the analysis. I think there are a few other things that I would just add. One, we have to be very honest with ourselves, right? The history of education is also mired in white supremacy and white dominance. And part of that is also a larger concern. This is not teacher bashing or blaming, but a larger issue around how the communities in which our students are located and how the, their families are situated, right? And so I don't think we can have the conversation divorced from a larger understanding that as well, there are deficit perspectives around particularly communities of color, right? And seeing these spaces as empty spaces that don't necessarily have things to offer. And I think of, of for instance, Terrence Green's work, um, and he focuses on community school relations and thinking about how we might do a community-based audit, right? To think about what the communities have to offer. So we really have to be very clear about um, what our communities have to offer and see them as assets from the very beginning so that it seems natural and necessary that we actually want to interact and engage and be in community with the communities in which our schools are located and the homes from which our students arrive. Um, I think the point about neoliberalism is very clear as well, right? So. I say these things understanding that two or more things could be true at once, right? We want to make sure that teachers um, <laughs> are supported and valued um, and that we know that teachers and administrators are often overworked by uh, overworked and under-resourced, also knowing that there are challenges uh, interpersonally that exist, but also understand that there's a larger political and economic and social context that shapes schooling. And right, part of that context is, for instance, uh, with neoliberalism, not only is it the expansion of market logics and saying that you know competition is the ideal way of organization, but also an increased forms of accountability, right? And so, and that being limited to say standardized testing. So the relationship building um, that's necessary often becomes mired in the test preparation. So I think there's a lot of things that are happening, um, but I think as well, you know, I, I believe in something that Miles Horton, one of the leaders of the Highlander Folk School once said, is that the people with the problem are the people with the solution. So part of what's happening is that we, and I, I'm so thankful for being on this panel, but also that we, we situate this in terms of what we can be telling you as faculty or professors. And I think part of the larger project of reimagining is for us to think about how do we work in tandem with communities and parents to come up with the solutions that are best viable and most um, important and tangible in their lives and, and really does something that's worthwhile. And so I think we have to bring all folks to the table um, to answer these questions because therein lies the solution. All right, thank you, Dr. Henry. So now we're gonna we're gonna move to some closing remarks and just everybody getting a chance to weigh in on one final question. Before we do that, I just wanna to add that um, and encourage our panelists to respond if they can. Michelle Cruz asked a question in the chat around setting up a restorative justice program. How do you start that? How do you get it going? Uh, how do you start the process? Are there examples of districts that are doing this really well that people know of that they could share? So if I know Dr. Henry, that's the focus of your work uh, and, and, and Gloria, uh, Ms. Reyes, obviously you're embedded in a school district. So if you guys could pop, hopefully address that question a little bit in the chat, that'd be great. So the final ask here is to ask each person to talk for three minutes roughly on just what's an insight or a practice that you will actually take away with you today from this. And that could be something that's inspired by uh, the fellow panelists, um, the thoughts that have, that have come and flow back and forth and the rich discussion that we've had. So, you know, obviously it's a disadvantage to go first, but I gotta pick somebody. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna pick, I guess, Dr. Irby, if you could, you seem like you'd be good off the cuff. So let's, Talk to us. Uh, I think my main takeaway is that um, the work requires um, multiple approaches from many angles. Um, I think that's what I'm taking away. Um, it's a, 
it's a, uh, this it's a large um, issue. It's a persistent issue. Um, racial racism is a persistent issue. Um, and there's just many different angles to um, to work to address and begin to uh, to do anti-racist work um, and engage in anti-racist leadership practices. Um, and so my big takeaway is how complex um, and how deeply ingrained uh, racism is uh, in school systems and uh, that the level of um, systemic nature of it requires um, a holistic and systemic response to it. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Saffold, you got some closing words for us around and some takeaways for you? Yes, sir. Uh, my big takeaway as I was listening to uh, my fellow colleagues is um, the ideas that, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Irby, that Dr. Irby presented with the relational versus compliance. And um, the reason that that spoke to me is I'm always thinking of ways that I can apply what I hear when I learn into my current role um, as the district security um, director. And that is um, how can I train and present this idea of relational versus compliance to the police department um, that's in this community. One of the reasons I was hired was because I could speak that police language, but also speak that school language. And when I was hired, there was a lot of contention around there. But um, hearing those words have really triggered and got me to thinking differently about what I can present to the police department so that when they respond to our school, uh, their approach um, because anybody could call them the community call them you know um, a staff member can call them but when they come if they can come with that approach of uh, looking at our students um, taking off that de that dehumanization lens and looking from an, an approach of, of, of uh, uh, relationships versus compliance I think that'd go a long way uh, for me what I'm trying to accomplish so thank you very much uh, Dr. White uh, any closing thoughts from you please I thought about as Mr. Saffel was, was speaking, this importance of having people in leadership roles who can identify with the communities that they are legally and ethically charged with serving. And that reminded me of Dr. Henry's comment about who's in our community and who's teaching our students. I had the privilege of teaching in the same school district that produced me. So that was quite a privilege and it enabled me with like this extra sensory perception around how to connect with my students. Advantage for me, often a disadvantage for those who do not come from the communities in which they are teaching. And that is not to say that you have to, but it does provide you with a sense of understanding that you wouldn't otherwise have unless you have been there or you take the time to get there and spend time there. The, the other takeaway is, was, based on Dr. Irby's comments initially around widening our, our ideas around traditional terms. Dr. Irby mentioned this broad notion of violence and what that really is. And then also the broad notion of discipline and what that really is. I would add to the notion of violence and discipline, also thinking about words like incarceration and what that really looks like for students and communities. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Henry, some closing thoughts on what you've heard and what you're taking away today? Yeah, um, I would say give it up, right? And what I mean to suggest there is I'm, I'm thinking of a phrase from the, the book, The Salt Eaters, and it says, do you want to be healed? And I think the work of anti-racist education, uh, restorative justice, uh, transformative justice, any of the efforts that we are trying to um, engage requires us giving up the world as we know it. And if this pandemic has taught us nothing, it's that, that we can move beyond the world as we know it. And in fact, we have to. If we want to see our children succeed, if we want to create schools that are actually worthy of our children, we have to give up those things that we hold on to. Uh, and that one of those things is this notion and connection um, to the incarcerate to, to uh, the prison industrial complex and these logics of carciality. So we have to give those things up. We have to give up uh, the, the the efforts of white supremacy and its in its often morphic nature. We have to fight against those things, and it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be you know stickers and lollipops, but it is what's right, and it will be hard. 
But I, I do believe that we can do it um, because as James Baldwin has says, the ticket has already been paid and it's our work to do that. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, letting go is a powerful thing. It could be a lot of catharsis there and need for sure. All right, Mr. Miss, Miss Reyes, can you give us your thoughts and takeaways for today? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just would like to reiterate what uh, Dr. Henry said. Uh, it's, you know, I think that, um, and um, th this is very complex. Uh, and I wish I could take every everybody on this panel as uh, an MMSD uh, guidance uh, um, guidance team uh, for MMSD in this work. Um, I I think we have so many educational scholars uh, in this community. Uh, we have uh, community groups who are really navigating and doing this work. I, I just would love to see um, action and sort of movements forward um, using all the skills and experience on this panel. Um, I've learned so much tonight, um, you know, from educational enclosures in terms I've never heard of uh, before, um, but uh, so valuable in the work that uh, we are doing. And so I'm just going to take all this and don't be surprised if I contact you later on uh, to do some work. I think that's the goal, Ms. Reyes. I'm hopeful that this is a point of connection for everyone. And it could be a be careful what you wish for because some of these folks will get in there and do the work and be ready to get, get the hands dirty in, in all the good ways. So I just want to commend everyone for, for bringing so much thoughtfulness to the research to, and the way you've presented it in such an amazingly uh, accessible, but still powerful, real way. Um, you all bring a wealth of different experiences and I think we've all benefited greatly from getting to hear them. So um, my, my brother, Dr. Charleston, now is going to give us some closing remarks in, in only the way that, in the way that he only can do and we'll sit back and enjoy them, but. Wow, thank you, Dr. Dr. Lashley. Um, you know, thank you all for the, the awesome knowledge and unique perspectives you all brought to this enriching conversation. Um, your experiences and, and expertise indeed shed light on the subject of school discipline and, and, and policing. Um, I feel many of our perspectives, or let me, let me speak for myself. Um, my perspective here before has been shaped by my unique individualized experiences. Uh, but hearing the research, the policy, the practical perspectives you all brought to this conversation uh, has significantly contributed to, to our goal of addressing inequities in school uh, policies, discipline, and policing. Um, these Real Talk, Real Change Symposium series keeps on getting better and better. I appreciate you all, all for coming. Um, I likewise appreciated uh, the rich dialogue occurring in the chat from our community and campus constituents. It seems like uh, we just don't have enough time to, to get through everything, but to be able to bring scholars, practitioners, administrators, teachers and parents, community constituents and others together uh, to share ideas and enhance our understanding of, of, of these policies and what we could and should be doing about it um, at a time as critical as this moment we're currently in right now, um, is really nothing short of a blessing. Uh, we, we know or have learned that we can all play a role in shaping our students' experiences in school. As Gloria Reyes uh, reminded us, relationships are at the heart of what works, right? We know that schools uh, can replace exclusionary discipline with guidance interventions or, or strategies such as uh, behavior interventions and supports of social emotional learning and restorative justice that we talked a lot about today. We know that schools could and should integrate an explicit focus on equity uh, into uh, behavioral initiatives and get back to building trust in the communities and with families. Without an equity focus, even improvements in behavioral outcomes might not reduce disproportionalities in behavioral outcomes, right? Uh, we know that we must equip teachers with the tools and skills necessary to promote culturally responsive and competent classroom instruction. And likewise, disciplinary programs must be culturally responsive. But as Dr. White had mentioned, what's culturally responsive for some might not be culturally responsive for others. And we must look at the context. Part of this equipping of our teachers directly correspond with their understanding of the belief system toward equity, diversity, and inclusion. How can we, as, as Mr. Saffold has said, buffer the idea of resources and uh, whether it's school psychologists, counselors, a cadre of people to assist teachers and administrators in responding and redirecting students to keep them in class, 
right? To be sure we must provide the professional development opportunities for all of our K-12 faculty and staff that promote reflections on individual backgrounds and belief systems as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, what are at the predispositions that allow our teachers to look at some students in dehumanizing matter, in a dehumanizing frame, as Dr. Henry discussed? We need to really think about how to equip teachers to be effective with our students. Dr. Henry, Henry also reminded us that we must move past our lack of imagination of what we can do and what should be done in our schools and challenge schools to be better, both observing and addressing the larger context that is indeed shaping our education systems, which means we have to address racism, inequality, ableism, sexism, and more, right? We know that our practices should be data informed, right? We didn't talk enough about that to me today, for me today. Like that's right, what I would have talked about. You know, in other words, schools should be analyzing student discipline data as well as stakeholder feedback and observations um, like parents and faculty and students and coordinating with other community organizations as Ms. Reyes had talked to us about and others on the panel have mentioned as well. Um, and, and it's working on right now to not only identify and call out inequitable practice related to discipline, but to also develop plans and establish innovative and just effective policies to improve equity. We must move more toward a relational and interest orientation as Professor Irby has reminded us, wherein the relationships, wherein, uh, the relationships uh, that cultivate discipline and uh, where, is, where it is the relationships that cultivate discipline and an interest orientation that cultivates learning based on pre-existing activities of interest that are relevant to our students' lives. Such important uh, contributions today. Uh, I, I hope and trust that this symposium has helped each of us to better understand inequities in school policies, policing, and discipline, as well as a path forward toward achieving equity therein. Uh, I'm grateful for this conversation, and, and I believe we are in a better position now than we, than we were a couple of hours ago to solve problems, to reflect on the values of our shared experiences, the strength of community, the value of solidarity, and our ability to utilize one another as resources as I talk about often, as we reflect on our own practices that work toward advancing equity in school discipline policies and, and policing practices. Uh, we look forward to the next opportunity to support each other, to learn, to grow with one another. Our next RTRC symposium is slated for Thursday, November 19th, and we'll dive into the subject of advancing hip hop as a path toward equity. I hope to see you all there. Thank you again to all the panelists, to the facilitators, to all the guests and everyone who wrote in the chat, to all who participated in this event. And again, special thanks to Wisconsin Center for Education Products uh, and Services, and then uh, School of Education's Impact 2030 Initiative for sponsoring this event, and Dean Diana Hess for helping to make this all possible. And I'll close with this quote from Margaret Mead. I say it all the time. You all probably get tired of me saying it, but never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has.